This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. Producer Mike Cotton and surfer Larry Martin discuss the documentary Back to China Beach on this edition of Conversations. Larry Martin is a Pensacola, Florida native who has spent most of his life riding the waves. From 1967 through 1969, he found himself surfing China Beach right in the middle of the Vietnam War. Martin was an integral part of the China Beach Surf Club, which would become legendary within the surfing community. He is featured prominently in the new documentary, Back to China Beach. Mike Cotton has spent over a half of century in the entertainment and promotions business. Recently, he and his business partner, Dave Barnes, set out to tell the story of the China Beach Surf Club. In their documentary, Back to China Beach, they show how being one with the waves is real, even in the midst of war. Here's a look. In 1967, when I got to uh, China Beach, and I found that they had a few surfboards there, and I was very excited. It, it was one of the things that kind of reminded me of being home and made me feel a little bit, you know, not so lost in a foreign country. So what I did is uh, after I had got familiar with a lot of the guys down there, I told them the lifeguards what I would do, I would be willing to come down, take the responsibility of, of the, the surfboards and then they could concern themselves more with the lifeguarding. It all worked out really well. Uh, eventually, uh, after giving tests to very, various people that came down there that wanted surfboards, I think by the time that I left in 69, there was approximately 175 cards that we had issued over a time period. Over the course of time, we were able to actually uh, get more boards after about a year and a half when I was there. But I was very fortunate enough that I found a nurse that was down at the uh, hospital there in Da Nang. She was leaving country. She just happened to be down the beach one day, said she had a surfboard for sale. And of course, my eyes lit up real big, and what I did, I made my way down to the hospital, which was really strange, because here I was, young kid, gonna get a surfboard in Vietnam, my whole life was gonna change and be my own personal board, I didn't have to borrow a board anymore. And as I'm walking to the tarmac, helicopters were flying in and bringing soldiers straight off the field, uh, in baskets off the side of the, uh, the helicopters. And I remember the uh, attendants running out from tents with the sutures attached to all their shirts, clips and everything to seal off all the wounds and everything. And I thought how ironic it is, here I am thousands of miles away from my home, a surfer, and I'm on my way to walk through the triage and where they're operating to go to a back room to buy a surfboard from a nurse that's leaving Vietnam. for China Beach and went for people like Larry that got the boards there and, and realized how important it was to a very small amount of people compared to the, all the guys that were over there. But China Beach was, uh, it was a gift from heaven. And, you know, I mean, 
the whole surfing thing with a blessing. So the documentary, Back to China Beach. Mike, what was your inspiration for doing this documentary? Probably in 1965, I was a young surfer lad in South Florida growing up. We moved down there, my family from Atlanta, and uh, got the surfing bug about 1963. And uh, uh, quite a few of my friends went to Vietnam, and I got a phone call one day that a friend had come back, had been wounded in Vietnam. and. Um, so I went over to see him and welcome uh, this fellow home and I uh, said, I'm sorry you got wounded, but it was your ticket home. And he said, well, not really. I said, I got shot in the butt. It was a superficial wound. I was fine in a week or two. And I was like, well, I don't understand. He says, well, I had to stay another six months. I said, explain this to me. He goes, well, uh, we were having a meeting with our CO and they were looking for volunteers to be lifeguards uh, at these different beaches. And he said, a buddy of mine shouted out my name that I was a lifeguard in Fort Lauderdale. And he says, the next thing I knew, I was on a beach called Cameron Bay. And I spent six months there uh, lifeguarding. And of course, the next thing that I asked him was, was there any surf? And he said, oh yeah, and it was really good. And he had a board and he said that the guys would come down there on R&R &R and uh, they would surf and he got to surf every day. So that was the first time I heard the story. And then over the years, I heard bits and pieces and just thought this whole story was, was fascinating. And the, really the fact that these guys could get a little relief from the stress of combat yeah. by getting in that water, whether they were surfing or not. But just being at the beach, and I think anybody that likes the water will tell you that. If they've yeah. had a rough day, a bad day at the beach is even better. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Larry, you you were a, a surfer growing up, and, and tell me your story. How, how did you get to Vietnam, and how did, how did you get involved with the surf club? Well, I, I was actually drafted in the Army for two years, I didn't want to go to Vietnam, so I joined the Navy for four, went right to Vietnam. <laughs> <laughs> and then after I got there, I got there in, uh, in November of 67, and uh, it took a little while for me to calm down before I could actually decide to, to go off base. You know, when you're first there, you don't want to do nothing wrong. Right. So I got down to the China Beach there, and I realized that there were some surfboards down there. Wasn't very many, and they were... Some were okay, some were, you know, there were some of them, there was pieces hanging on the walls and stuff like that. And at that time, they were just issuing all the boards out to anybody and everybody. Well, after I kind of became friends with the lifeguard guys down there, because I was working night shifts off during the daytime, spent a lot of time down there, I told them that, you know, if they would let me have access to the area down there whenever I wanted to, that I would take over the surfboards, do all the repair work and stuff like that. And that's how I kind of slid myself right in. <laughs> <laughs> After that, um, you know, we issued a bunch of cards. We uh, initially got a bunch of new surfboards for the guys. And at one point, I even uh, was lucky enough, I bought a surfboard from a girl that was a nurse down at the um, Army base there at the hospital and she was leaving Vietnam. She said, I got a surfboard for sale. And I said, I'm your man. <laughs> <laughs> so you issued the cards because you had to have a card to get a surfboard. You had to have a card because that, you know, at that time you didn't really want anybody and everybody to get, a, get boards because all they did was just ding them up and mess them up. Plus you spent most of the time trying to, to, to go out and save them. Right. So you had, if you had another person, like say if you was a surfer and you come down there, your eyes got real big and said, oh my God, there's surfboards down there. You know, I, I want to do that. So, of course, you want, you want to get that surfboard or, or loan that surfboard off to that guy right. and let him enjoy it because he can really get the feeling. Right, of right, that. right. It, it, were there folks, though, who wanted to try it? They would say, oh, that looks like fun. I, I, yes, there was. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you had to turn them away and you could see that kind of pouty, pouty look on their face. You know, they kind of get the bobo lips up. But, you know, you could, after you talk to somebody, after even three or four minutes, you kind of knew if, if the person had, had any kind of background or anything. Yeah. First thing I always ask them is, where are you from? <laughs> what state are you from? If you're from Kansas City, most likely you're not going to get used to the surfboard. <laughs> right. and, and you weren't in the business of giving instruction, I assume. No, no, not then, not yeah. then. Yeah. You know, it, was, it was bad enough to, um, with the conditions over there. I mean, it was, there was some ideal surf. I mean, it was some beautiful big surf. I surfed some stuff that was over 20 feet. Of course, I was a lot younger then. Yeah. Now, I'm not that young. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, you didn't want to just take out people and just spend that much time. But what I would do is I would take out the guys that were potential candidates to be able to get a card. I would go out, be on my surfboard right beside them. I let them surf, keep an eye on them. And if I felt like they could handle themselves, and I wasn't going to have to worry about them, go out and save them, then they, when they got finished, they'd come back, I'd issue them a card. Then all they had to do was come down, show that card. Tell and me. I, 
Do, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. And I also had a log book. Uh-huh. Actually, it's 1967, there were some cards that was already there. Somebody had tried to start a surf club, and it just never did take off. I mean, there was, you know, the whole time I was there, I never saw a card from 67. So I, when I kind of took over in, in 68, we, we actually built a clubhouse, and we started issuing the cards. And by the time that <coughs> I had left, I issued almost 180 cards. Oh, wow. So there was that many happy people out there. They might not come down one time, but they got a card, you know, and then they go back in the ville. But we had a lot of guys in the afternoons, you know, they'd get off like I was. We were stationed local. They'd come down, and we'd have the whole afternoons, or, you know, you'd use your R&R. So I used all my R&R time. <coughs> I, I just stayed there at the beach. How did it evolve to become such a big deal? I don't know if it was a big deal to, to the members. Uh, if, if you were able to kind of get together and talk about, well, oh, I'm from California, I'm from San Diego, I'm from Florida, and you sit around and you would reminisce about your time growing up and surfing and all the good times you had, and then here you are, you're sitting around a group of buddies and stuff during the daytime, and you're talking, you're drinking beer, and you're having a good time, you don't really realize that you're in a war zone mm-hmm. until you look up and maybe you see a couple of new guys coming in from R&R okay. with their guns on their back and their, their greens that are on and got all mud all over them. And then, but mainly at nighttime, you knew you were in a war zone because you'd be sitting out there drinking a beer at nighttime or something. You could see the rockets going off and everything. Mike, as you did your research and interviewed folks along the way, what most surprised you? I think just really the different dimensions of the story. I think, um, you know, I've I've worked on a lot of these projects like this, a lot of them with Dave in the last 10 years or so. And Dave Barnes, I have to say, has been tremendous. He he was a great editor on this. He was the director and uh, we've co-produced probably a couple hundred projects in the last 10 years, a lot of news and (coughs) some other TV shows. Uh, This is our third documentary. Uh, We did actually one about the history of surfing in the Panhandle, which was interesting. Did one about the notorious uh, Florabama uh, on their 50th anniversary. But uh, once we had decided, this was about four or five years ago, how we got the ball finally rolling on this because, you know, I kept hearing stories over the years and being a surfer, I would meet surfers that were veterans that had been at China Beach or there was other beaches. There was uh, Eagle Beach, Cameron Bay. There's probably six or eight different beaches where they were surfing, but China Beach at Da Nang was, of course, by far the most famous and probably had the most traffic uh, of R&R people yeah. going, going to the beach compared right. to the other ones, which was really a smaller situation. But um, we got a lot of, like in this clip, uh, Carol Law um, was interesting because she was not a surfer. She was a director of the USO Club at Da Nang in 67. Um, got sent over her husband. Uh, they were based in Pensacola. Her husband was a Marine fighter pilot. And the joke in her family was he got to stay stateside and teach, but she got sent to a war zone <laughs> to work for the USO. And she worked with Bob Hope and Connie Stevens and uh, uh, Ann Margaret and people like that that came over there. But she brought a different aspect of these young men coming there and so young and, and trying to capture a little bit of home for a short period of time. And that was firsthand what Larry experienced was these guys coming in off the battlefield And maybe they were from Florida, they were from California, maybe they were from Kansas and just, you know, wanted to experience that beach. And um, and I've seen many letters that have been written to Larry over the years of these people saying, you know, just getting out there for one day or two days or three days. For the moment, I was back in Florida, I was back in California, I was back in Hawaii, you know. um, So it was just very amazing the effect that this had on these people of helping them get get through the war. And then later on, talking to veterans, um, um, some of the people involved in the film, Ronnie Ratliff, who we met through through Facebook, there's so many different connections that had been made and then people began to contact me and tell me their stories and we'd either try to get to them or they'd get to us and we would interview them. And some had memorabilia, I mean, Larry, when we first started uh, uh, working with Larry, he has a footlocker full of memorabilia. It was amazing the stuff that we went through. but. Uh, mm-hmm. To back up, we were actually filming part of this uh, Florida surfing history, the Panhandle chapter, uh, out on Pensacola Beach one day, and this was about five years ago, and somebody walked up and says, hey, that guy you heard about, Larry Martin's down at the Yancey Spencer 
uh, statue Lord. dedication. Yeah. And I says, well, what's he look like? Because I knew I needed somebody <laughs> that knew the story and was there, yeah. and he was the guy. I mean, everywhere I went, oh, you got to speak to Larry Martin. So he says, oh, you'll know him. He's rather tall, and he's going to have on a jacket and a big China Beach uh, patch on the back of it. <laughs> and sure, I, I ran down the beach and stopped the interviews we were doing with these other people from the East Coast, and I'm tugging on his jacket, hey, man, hey, man. I says, uh, I want to talk to you. He goes, oh, I know about you. Now, I don't really know if I want to do this or get involved. And he hemmed and he awed. And, um, but I bugged Larry for, for a while. And I heard maybe his wife encouraged him, too, that, you know, here's a couple guys ready to lay in on the line to right. do this story. And, you know, a project like this, you don't know where it's going to go right. because it's a labor of love. You know, it's not like a corporate project or whatever. And it's just something we wanted to do. So um, after a year or two of talking with Larry and having meetings, we decided to move forward with, with the interviews and collecting uh, the content that we needed for the film. And uh, we interviewed surfers, non-surfers, pilots, uh, colonels, you know, a lot of different people there. But a lot of the surfers had uh, a lot of the similar stories that, you know, that was just like a lifesaver, you know, to them to be able to go out there and do that. Therapy. Yeah. Therapy. And then the amazing thing is, when we uh, finally met Ronnie, who's from Oklahoma, really was from Texas, and he spent, he was there in, what, 69, and learned to surf there. Uh, he had gotten in touch with me, and he says, hey, I take groups of veterans back there. And I said, well, how did that happen? He goes, well, he says, I was in the, I had a lot of psychological issues. He says, one day I was in the VA, and a buddy of mine said, you're not going to, they're not going to help you very much here. You need to do what I did. You need to go back to Vietnam. And he, Larry, or Ronnie was like, are you crazy? He says, no. He says, it'll help you. He said, you need to go right to where you were, right to where the battles were. So Ronnie, kind of at his wits end, went over there, said he was, and a lot of this is in the, in the film, and he talks about hiding in the hotel for days on end and being afraid to even go out of the hotel. And then he began to go out and he began to talk to the people. And people wanted to talk with him and practice their English, wanted to know where he was from in the States. And today, I believe we were his 22nd trip back. He was our guide over there. We were the first non-veteran group to go over there. And we spent a week uh, around the Da Nang area, you know, filming of what it's like today. <laughs> of course, um, when some of the veterans see some of this footage, and Larry's seen, of course, a lot of it, it looks more like uh, Orange Beach, Gulf Shores, or Fort Lauderdale, or yeah, even Waikiki. Five-star hotels and everything. And it's, um, mm -hmm. all this has happened really within the last 15 years or so there. And uh, they love Americans, and uh, they want us to come back over there. There's nothing to be afraid of, and these are some of the most friendly people and accommodating people I've really ever met. I've done a lot of trips out of the country, and uh, um, just, it was, it was a great experience for us as well. So. Larry, would you like to go back? I would have. If I could get some some full size seats, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I tell you one thing about we flew Bob, to California a couple yeah, times to yeah, film, and no, I, I thought Larry's going to die. That was a bucket list that. for me. Yeah. I, going back to California was a bucket list for me. But let me tell you something about Ronnie. He got he got kind of talked into marrying a Vietnamese lady over there, and he'd already made several trips over there, and I don't think he ever he even had seen pictures of her. And uh, some of the family members that he had met going back and forth had convinced him that he needed to marry this girl. So he basically saved, saved the girl. And he said, he was telling me the story, he said when he walked up, never seen her, he's got a suit on, and he looks over and he sees this girl in a traditional marriage outfit. He said, is that who I'm marrying? And he said, man, am I lucky. <laughs> <laughs> and they've been happy. They, and in fact, he actually stayed in Vietnam and uh, stayed in Vung Tau yeah, for, yeah, about three years. for three years. So him and his wife could assimilate to each other and then initially brought her back to States, which is funny is now is if you ask Ronnie, you say, well, Ronnie, does your wife want to go back? She says, no, I don't want to go back. I don't want to ever go back. So, What's the biggest misunderstanding in both of your opinions that we have about the Vietnam War? Well, there's probably a lot of them. Uh, a lot of people, and I'm kind of a student of history and, and politics and things like that, but, uh, <clears throat> you know, that war we probably should have never gotten into in the first place. I mean, Ho Chi Minh actually loved America. He had even written a constitution that mimicked our constitution. But we had the French were there, and the French were pretty much get, beginning to get run out of there. It was a colony. And I guess just it was one of those things we had to, you know, make a decision. And um, 
the, the other part is, is how we kind of just gradually fell into that war and more. In fact, we even have footage of the Marines landing at China Beach wow. in the early 60s uh, that we got through uh, uh, National Archives. But um, the sad thing was the politicians ran that war and not, to, not the generals because that war could have ended pretty quickly, actually. So it drug out way, way too long. But the people, I mean, it's one of the most touching stories is where Ronnie talks about taking back veterans, and he's so well connected now with so many different people over there. He actually finds uh, VC, North Vietnamese soldiers uh, that these guys fought against, and he actually gets them together, and they go and have supper together, a couple of beers, and those guys, uh, same issues, you know, and, and but they have no animosity. They said that. Uh, you know, we were doing what we were, we were soldiers. Mm -hmm. We were serving our country. Of course, over there, they really didn't have much choice. Right, you know? right. So, right. Uh, you know, so those are some of the, the, the amazing stories that happened within this whole horrible situation that okay. was over there. So, you know, we like to think our film is way different from your typical Vietnam War type film. You know, ours has a happy ending, basically, in the end, because what we begin to do in this film as we kind of transition out of what was going on in the 60s and the early 70s and we begin to tell these different stories as the years go by is uh, this healing of going back there and, and facing your demons, you know, so to speak. Some people affected them badly, other people didn't, uh, you know, and I don't know that Larry had a lot of, you know, issues with that. He doesn't show it if he did, but others, others did and uh, then to go back now and, and it's just, it's just totally different. Over Larry, there. how were you able to deal with it? I'll be honest with you. I was, I was lucky that I really didn't have any problem. I mean, I, I, might, I was scared the first month that I was there, and I was scared the last month that I was there. But after you realize that you, you know, you're going to be here a year, or you're going to be, you know, whatever your time frame is, you're going to have to stick it out. If it's going to happen, it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. I mean, that we've had. I had people that were fixing to leave. They were going to fly out one night, or some rockets came down through the middle of the barracks. Them guys had their whites on there waiting for their flight in two hours, and a bunch of them guys got killed. It's just, you know, luck of the draw. Mm -hmm. But like he, you know, he was saying, he said, Vietnam was an unpopular war. It's not like when Japan invaded Pearl Harbor, and I mean, America got behind it. Right. And, you know, we were ready to go over and, you know, just retaliate. I mean, there were so many people that was volunteering for it. And if you really think about it, nobody really wanted to volunteer to go to Vietnam. Right. And it's kind of the same situation now is like, you know, we were, we've been in Afghanistan for such a long time and it never, it, it was not popular. It was all about oil. But now it's like once the tw twin, twin Towers went down, that was a whole completely different thing. It's like now you've got a purpose. You mm -hmm. know, why are we sticking our nose into Vietnam where they didn't do anything to us, we're sticking our nose into them. You know? yeah. I've got a little less than about five minutes left. Tell me how you are going to distribute the film. I understand that you're going to be uh, showing it around the country to yes. various uh, veterans organizations. Yeah, we're, we're kind of doing it uh, organically, if you will. I mean, one of the folks that set the bar for me in documentaries was Bruce Brown when he did Endless Summer 1 in the mid-early 60s. and Nobody in the distribution business wanted to touch that film, but he, had, he knew he had a, a film that was built around surfing, but it was mainstream because it included all these other elements, which we definitely have in this film, uh, including original music by Tony Pasco, who Tony now resides here in Pensacola. He's got music on about 20 different TV shows, and we're working on another show that he produces, Duck Dynasty being his first okay. big hit with that. So we have all original music. It's not your typical uh, The Doors and Creedence Clearwater Revival right. and stuff. Those are great songs, but uh, we've got we've got our own music, you know, for this. So we're beginning now tour. Uh, um, we've done a premiere in Pensacola. I've got other veterans groups. We'll be doing an East Coast premiere over in Brevard County. And what we're doing is is trying to uh, work with veterans organizations where they will host us, provide a venue to show it, and then half the proceeds will be donated uh, to these organizations. So we're going to do this for about six months, maybe a year, and then eventually, as that kind of grassroots support happens and the word of mouth, which has already happened with the premiere, uh, then we'll probably shop it somewhat to distribution. And then eventually it's gonna go to, you know, uh, downloads to Netflix, Amazon, or wherever. What sort of response is the audience giving you, particularly veterans in the Well, the, the premiere was, was really the litmus test because we had okay. about 250 people there. 
easily half of those were veterans and Vietnam veterans. And I greeted everybody that came out of the theater. Um, and we did a little talk about how this whole thing even came about. And many of them came up to me and just said, this is the best depiction than anybody's done of this whole situation. And I said, thank you, but I couldn't have done it without you guys because you're the stars that it's raw, it's intense, it's emotional. There's funny stuff in there. Mm -hmm. There's all those elements. But we gave the veterans the opportunity to tell the real story rather than, I mean, Larry and I have been surfers our whole life. I'm sure when you saw the first beach party movies in the early 60s, we were like, what beach is this, you know? <laughs> Hollywood began to get it right maybe with some other. Yeah, it was like that players. here in Pensacola. <laughs> <laughs> Dick Dale was great on guitar. Not even in but, early you know, years. <laughs> you, know, you know, but so, you know, Hollywood, you know, some have been more realistic than others. I mean, Apocalypse Now, yeah, they had the guys surfing, and I doubt that actually happened, but, you know, yeah. this is similar. I don't know, there's some close stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I can tell you some stories. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, but it was Robert Duvall telling you to get out there and eat a surfer fight. You know? No, no, but you remember, I got, I got shot yeah, at. Yeah, got, I got shot, shot at while I was surfing. That's true. <laughs> but, um, so we're hoping that, uh, you know, because that, re that was the demographic I had to please if anybody yep. was these guys. They and were, gals. And they were clapping. They were literally yeah. clapping, which surprised me. I thought, it would be super quiet, and I would. And it was like that pause. It's kind of like some I've seen some other kind of movie where like nobody that? say nothing, and you go, "Oh man, it's a big disappointment." All of a sudden, you hear that that first, and then it just it just echoed in there, and then I knew we had it. Yeah, yeah. interesting. So it's uh, you know we've got it. We had a great crew. I mean, everybody that helped us with that. You know, the production people. You know, the veterans getting Carol Law. That was that was just that was a. That was a good coup right there, getting her, because she gave it a whole other aspect, you yeah. know, a whole other viewpoint of not being a soldier. And it sounds there. like, too, f from it, it could be a real educational experience for a young we person had, who didn't grow up in We that had era. families with kids, and, and yeah. we said, well, you know, this is, there's some pretty tense stuff in here, you know. Yeah. And they said, we want our kids to see what this story really is because they don't teach them this in school. The documentary is called Back to China Beach, and you can find out more about it I would just Social go to Mike Cotton Productions on Facebook. Okay. And we do have a, we just started a Back to China Beach uh, Facebook page, but these, I have several pages. They're all pretty much, we post the same things and, and the other projects we're working on. But right now, China Beach is what it's all about. Awesome. Uh, and we will be launching a website. That sounds great. Congratulations. Thank you. And I, I do have a China Beach Surf Club okay. Facebook page. If, if anybody's interested, we want to see the pictures there. Sounds great. Gentlemen, thank you so much. I wish you all the very best. Thanks for having us Thank on. you. Appreciate it. You are welcome. By the way, you can see more of our conversations online at wsre.org slash conversations, as well as on YouTube. I'm Jeff Weeks. Thank you so very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the broadcast. Take wonderful care of yourself. See you soon.